I start now. So thank you all uh, very much. So I drew a picture of what I think must be the bridge that we've been talking about. But from my point of view, physics is on this side. And every time I try to cross, I sort of fall inside. Uh, but anyway, today I'll try to do just a little better. Is, is there a pointer? Okay. Um, ah, that, very good. Okay. So uh, my talk will be based on this paper, which just came out about three weeks ago with Brandon Rehon. Uh, he might be attending actually. And uh, there's some older work of mine that I'll use, which is uh, these two papers uh, with a master's student in 2019. Some older papers with another master's student, Harsha, and with Gabardil, and then some really old papers uh, from 1988. Okay. So uh, two I'll, I'll, I'll um, introduce a little notation just because it might be a slightly diverse audience. So I'll just say a few words about CFT. Uh, in its modern form, 2D CFT has been studied very intensely for nearly four decades, starting with this classic work. Of course, it was a subject before and was studied before too. Uh, the characteristic of such theories is that they are QFTs having infinitely many symmetry generators that generate conformal transformations. And there are two copies of this Vera Soro algebra. And this algebra has a central element C that in any theory takes a fixed real value called the central charge. And for unitary CFT, it's a necessary condition that C be greater than zero. Of course, it's not sufficient. Okay, I'll just quickly list some physics motivations why we should study these. I think people are familiar with them critical systems, relativistic strings, ADS3, CFT2, maybe, uh, anions, and then something related to that called topological quantum computing, which is in quotes because I think it doesn't exist, but it might in the future. Then mathematical motivations, uh, which are interconnected in some way, uh, vertex operator algebras, modular tensor categories, vector valued modular forms, and what we heard from Jeff uh, in great detail last week, moonshine modules. So these are some of the motivations. Okay, now uh, an important fact for me will be that CFTs often come with additional symmetries uh, beyond the Vera Soro algebra. And one of the most important and which plays a fairly central role in today's talk is the katz moody algebra which is a generalization uh, of Lie algebras to infinite dimensions. And it also has a central element called the level K. And FABC are the structure constants of a usual reductive Lie algebra. Okay, now CFTs that are based entirely on katz moody algebras go by the name of Vesumino witten theories. And in such theories, the Virasoro generators themselves are not independent, but they are bilinear composites of the currents, this is called the Sugawara construction. And that means currents in some sense can be more fundamental even than conformal symmetries. Okay, now the Hilbert space is graded by conformal dimensions, which are the eigenvalues of L0 and L0 bar. It decomposes into modules over highest weight states called phi i, these are primaries. Um, and the primaries are defined by being highest weight, which means the A's for whatever the chiral algebra might be, and I late the state for all positive integers n. Well, they need not be integers in general. For my purposes, they will be integers though. Okay. Now, uh, the conformal dimensions of the primaries, we'll call them hi and hi bar. And there's always a distinguished primary called the vacuum with h and h bar being zero. And then all the other states are spanned by, are called descendants, and they're spanned by uh, excitations over the primary by the negative modes of the chiral and antichiral algebras. Now, the subject of this talk will be rational conformal field theory, and that arises when the number of primaries phi i is finite. And there's actually a theorem due to Anderson and Moore that if this number is finite, then the central charge and the conformal dimensions are rational numbers, hence the name. Uh, an important object for physicists to study, and I think also for mathematicians, is the partition function of a 2D CFT, defined as a trace of this form over Q and Q bar, uh, raised to L0 and L0 bar with some constant shift that's important. Q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And in a rational CFT, uh, this takes the form of a finite sum 
over bilinears of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic characters. So these characters are the trace in a single module of just Q to the L0 minus C by 24. And because of this, unlike the partition function, these are holomorphic. So you can roughly think that the partition function is the sum of mod squares of holomorphic objects with finitely many terms. I should say to avoid confusion that these chi's may not be characters of any algebra that you already know, like katz moody characters or Virasoro characters, though those are very well-known characters. For this purpose, they are the characters under whatever happens to be the full chiral algebra of the theory, which is the thing that I will not specify in advance. Okay, and characters are holomorphic in the interior of moduli space, but they typically have fractional behavior at as Q goes to zero, which is tau going to I infinity, and that can be either divergent or going to zero, but either way, it's uh, typically fractional. Now, from the assumed equivalence of operator and path integral quantizations of QFT, it has been argued that the partition function of a conformal field theory should be modular invariant under all of SL2Z. And this is the statement. And in RCFT, this will be true if and only if the characters are vector valued modular functions of weight zero. So Z itself is of weight zero, but it's not holomorphic. Chi's are of weight zero, but they're a multiplet or a vector. And they transform under a unitary n-dimensional representation rho of SL2Z uh, by chi going into a linear combination of all the chi's. Now it's of interest, but also impractical to classify all possible RCFT. Um, but uh, at least it would be useful to first classify all vector valued modular forms that could potentially be the characters of an RCFT and then ask the question whether they really are. And that's the way we look at it. Now, uh, general characters or general VVMFs have this sort of Q expansion where there's a fractional power of Q at the start. And then there are all these coefficients multiplying integer powers of Q. And if this thing is a CFT, then these A's, AI0, AI1, and so on, should be non-negative integers representing the number of states in the module at a particular height above the uh, primary. So if that's the case, we'll call these uh, such things admissible characters. So admissible characters will be when you have a set of chi i, which transform into each other under SL2Z, and also have all their A's, all their expansion coefficients, non-negative integers. Now it's a highly non-trivial restriction because there exist families of VVMFs for which these numbers can be, need not be positive, need not be integral, need not even be rational. So it's quite an unconstrained space in that sense. And when uh, they become admissible, that's a very special and magical point in the generic space of such objects. So the classification of RCFT, if you see it in this way, involves the two steps, classify admissible characters, and then restrict to those which correspond to actual CFT. Now, out of these, the first question is mathematically quite well defined. The second question is a little bit of an art. And so we'll see that there's a certain amount of guesswork and consistency and so on. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's not always appreciated that these are two separate problems. In fact, there's some folklore, which even now seems to appear in the literature once in a while, that sort of one and two, these two sets are the same. That is, whenever you have an admissible uh, set of characters, they must be the characters of something that's uh, really as wrong as it can be in both ways. Uh, turns out, and it's actually been well known for a long time, but it's just becoming clearer and clearer, that most admissible characters don't describe any CFT, uh, and also some admissible characters describe multiple CFT. So you can have the same spectrum of states for multiple CFT. Now, there are people here who worked in string theory, the heterotic string, there's even a person who invented it, and they know this very well. Uh, there's a famous example at central charge 16 of SO32 and E8 cross E8, but which have the same character, but it's a very general feature uh, of RCFT. Now, since, as I've said, classifying all RCFT is impractical, uh, we must impose some restrictions and try to classify in some subspace, which is nice. Uh, 
So we could either restrict the chiral algebra or the central charge or the number of characters or the number of primaries, which is almost but not exactly the same thing. I'll explain that. Or the Ronskian index, which is something I'll talk about in detail, and then classify within these restrictions. So if we denote uh, an RCFT with precisely P primaries uh, as a PCFT, I'll use this repeatedly in the talk, then the following are some such restricted classifications. So P here is not a prime, P is also not pizza, which it was last week, P is number of primaries. Okay, so one way is specifying central charge, and this is the most famous of all classification sub problems in CFT, it's all the PS, PCFT with central charge less than one. At central charge one, it's still a conjecture, I believe, that all PCFT are given by a single compact free boson at rational values uh, and orbifolds thereof, which is something I forgot to write, excuse me. Um, and uh, some outliers, so uh, people who know this know the story. I didn't write this completely. Okay, the second way of classifying is to specify the chiral algebra. And here, if you look at the SUN series or the AN series, then for A1 at all levels K, A2 at all levels K, and AN at level one, these are all classified. AN at level one has a nice relation with uh, Narayan lattice, well, with lattices in general. Uh, and I think Terry Gannon gave a talk here on this problem. Unfortunately, I missed it. Okay, so those are two types of classifications. Here's the third one where we specify the number of primaries and the central charge. So uh, for C less than 32, all one CFTs are classified. So one CFTs are sometimes called meromorphic CFTs, but my collaborator and I could not agree on that term because they're really meromorphic only if C is a multiple of 24, but otherwise their character transforms by a phase. So we agreed to call them one CFT, that's always correct. Uh, and as you probably know, these exist at central charge a multiple of eight, so if C is less than 32, then it's 8, 16, or 24. And 24 was the interesting, most interesting and non-trivial case for which Shelikins argued famously that there are exactly 71 one CFTs. And this is now, uh, although his arguments were quite uh, based on bringing a lot of inputs of various kinds, and it's, it's still a hard paper to read, uh, these uh, people and other several other mathematicians have worked on the goal of making this rigorous, and apparently now it's understood in a very nice way in the math literature. Now, one more way, which is not that widely known, is specifying the number of primaries and the Ronskian index, which I'm about to define in a few slides. And this was initiated by us for the case L equals zero in 1988. We found a classification and uh, recent work of Mason, Nagatomo, and Sakai. Uh, I keep quoting this with different dates. I think it's really a preprint from 2018, but maybe published in 2021, uh, who proved that this classification is complete and unique. Three CFT, that is three primary CFT with L equals zero are close to being classified. So we started this also in 1989, but there's been very nice progress in recent years and it seems to be getting there, but there are infinitely many. So it's a little more tricky. And very recently in a generalization of uh, the L equals zero case and also some cases we worked on earlier, uh, these authors have classified uh, all what they call rigid two CFTs and rigid means L less than six. So in this talk, I'll present another entry to this classification program. And again, it will be with fixed P and C. By fixed, I mean either fixed or bounded. Uh, so it's the complete classification of unitary RCFT with two primaries called one and phi, where phi is real. If it was complex, then there would be uh, three primaries, one phi and phi bar, and C restricted to be less than 25. There are no restrictions on the chiral algebra, Ronskin index, or anything else. In that sense, this is complete. And the result is a set of 123 theories that I'll somehow try to walk you through, walk you through in the remaining time. Yes, please. Uh, no, unitarity doesn't mean phi is real. For example, SU3 has a, three, a phi in the three and a phi bar in the three bar. 
So it has, we'll come to that case in a minute. So it has only two characters because the three and three bar have the same character. Basically they have the same group theory, but, uh, but they are different primaries. So the, in, in mathematics, they call this case two simple modules, one and five. Phi is the field, but the field in a current algebra is an example in a, no, no, phi, sorry. Yeah, phi is, phi is the name of the primary. Or maybe in, in as in Alice in Wonderland, it's the name. Of, it's what the name of the primary is called. Okay, all right. Okay, now this classification method. I'll be a little bit historic here because I think I have the time, and it, you might find it interesting. So this method was proposed first in 1988 uh, by uh, Samir Mathur, Ashok Sen, and myself. Uh, and or there was also a paper of Eguchi and Oguri in 1988, which used the same similar MLDEs for minimal models. But unlike us, they didn't use it as a classification tool. They used it more to find the characters in some cases where the model was known. Uh, I should say both of us were inspired strongly by the Verlinde formula, which had just come out earlier that year. Uh, because that also espoused the more abstract way of thinking about CFT without talking of the chiral algebra. At least in my mind, it's one of the earliest papers where the generic story of CFT was, was sort of presented without any prejudice, whether it's C less than one, minimal, Vera Soro, Katz Moody, or anything else. Okay, so then after finding admissible characters, which we did in this first paper, we used various techniques in the second paper, uh, in a follow-up paper, much longer one, to understand whether these describe a genuine CFT. And there's a lot of stories I can tell about that, but uh, only some of them might show up today. Now in detail, the proposed classification was by two fixed integers. N, uh, a positive integer, is the order of the MLDE, and that's the number of independent characters. Uh, L, which is greater than or equal to zero, is the Ronskin index. Now I mentioned this for the fourth or fifth time, so I should explain it soon. Now the case of direct interest for today's talk will be n equals two. In fact, it will be two primaries, which is a subcase of n equals two, as I just explained. So I'm going to restrict to that in most of my formulas because it's just easier. Many things generalize in an obvious way. So the basic idea is to write a general modular invariant linear differential equation that's holomorphic and examine its two linearly independent solutions to see when they are admissible. And it was sort of an experimental method which we, for which we had to use the available computing power of that time, which wasn't very much. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll show you how that worked. And whenever you find uh, admissible characters, you say, okay, these are candidates. Now we subject them to cross-examination and see whether they are CFTs or they're not. Now the most general, yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. So the most general uh, second order, M yeah, exactly. The most general second order MLD is in monic form uh, like this with coefficient functions phi two and phi four, which under SL2Z should transform as modular with weight two and four. And D is a covariant derivative that Don introduced, actually Don introduced uh, much of the notation I'll need today. And so that when it acts on something of weight N will map it to something of weight N plus two, which is also modular. Uh, but importantly, this phi two and phi four being of, yes. Okay, uh, I see. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, I call this covariant derivative because that's how we physicists thought, think of it. But if you don't like that word, I'll. I understand. So I shouldn't. I... Okay, I won't in future. Promise. <laughs> yeah, let's go on. Okay. So now the fun thing is that these phi 2 and phi 4, you might think have to be holomorphic for this to be a holomorphic equation. But in fact, they can be meromorphic with isolated poles. 
And the reason lies in the fact that I've chosen the uh, equation to be monic, which means the first term coefficient of the highest derivative is one. And if I didn't, so let me uh, clarify this by a very simple fact. Supposing we are looking for an MLD satisfied by a given vector valued modular form, chi zero, chi one. Supposing we know chi zero and chi one, and we want to write the condition that a general solution chi of the equation is a linear combination of chi zero and chi one. Well, then it follows that this determinant should be zero because the last column is a linear combination of the first two. Now, if we expand by the last column, we get this equation. And you see that we have an equation for the potentially unknown quantity chi with coefficients that depend, uh, that define the equation. And in this form, everything's holomorphic because chi zero and chi one were given to be holomorphic. But if you want to convert it to monic form, you need to divide through by the first guy. And it's that first one that I call the Ronskian. Actually, all these determinants are Ronskians, but the Ronskian is the first one, chi zero, chi one, d chi zero, d chi one. And after you do this division, it's pretty clear that phi two and phi four will develop poles whenever the denominator has zeros, which are not fortuitously canceled uh, by something in the numerator. So actually, uh, we have to think of these differential equations along with the number of poles that these coefficients phi two and phi four have. So what's that number? Well, we denote it L by six, where L is a non-negative integer and it can't be one for a reason we'll just see. Why one sixth? Because uh, there can be poles at the corners of moduli space at these two special points, and they count as having, frac oh, sorry, I wrote it the wrong way. The first one is one third, and the second one is of order a half. And you can also see that by taking linear, uh, integer combinations of half and one third, you can generate all integers, positive integers, except for one. Uh, sorry, except for one sixth, and that's why L cannot be one. So it's called the Ronskin index. Um, yeah. Now for two characters, there's an additional simplification, which is that L is even. Uh, this was shown by, I'm never sure how to say his name, but he was Jeff's student. Ne Nesulich, okay. Uh, it's a lovely paper. Actually, it was a follow-up to our first paper and he did a lot of beautiful things with the two character case. And uh, he also looked at the case L equals two and four and found interesting things which were never confirmed because everybody, including us, lost interest in this subject in around 1990. And then it came back uh, only about five or six years ago. Okay, now for any given L, there will be a finite basis of functions of E4 and E6 from which these coefficients phi two and phi four are built. For example, if L is zero, then there can't be a phi two because it, uh, there isn't any modular form of weight two, but if L is two, then E6 over E4 is a good phi two. So it's like that. So the MLD has a finite number of parameters that actually grows with L. Okay, now for future reference, uh, since we are talking about this Ron skin, it has singular behavior at infinity because the characters have this fractional behavior in Q and it has uh, zeros uh, somewhere in the middle. And obviously those must be related and the relation turns out to be this. And therefore in, in the case of two characters, if you know L and you know C, you also know H. So actually there's just one thing you need to know um, between C and H. Okay, now the idea that we had was to fix L to a small value and scan the parameter space to look for admissible solutions. And I'll show you an example which will make this clear. So we started with L equals zero because it's the easiest. And then this is the equation we got. It's, been, it's now in the VOA community, it's sort of called the MMS equation. Uh, but if you write it in ordinary derivatives, you'll see this is exactly the equation that Don discussed yesterday. And there it's called the kaneko zagi equation. And in fact, it's been very inspiring for some work that I've been doing more recently, which I'll bring up at the end of the talk, because it led to some developments uh, actually by Kaneko, Koike, and others, and Professor Nagatomo. And we use those uh, further on in the thing. But right now we're just focused on the MMS equation. And uh, good, uh, some notation. So let's denote the leading terms of the two characters as Q to the alpha zero and Q to the alpha one. And then uh, since we are just experimentally looking for vector valued modular forms, if we ever find any 
uh, with some alpha zero and alpha one, we'll just give them these names so that if there's a CFT, then those will be the CNH. But sometimes I'll, I'll say some VVMF has a given CNH, even if it doesn't uh, correspond to a CFT, then it's just notation. So we solve this equation by the Frobenius method to find the pair of solutions to as high order as we can go in Q. And we note that all the details of the solution, the exponents and the coefficients in this MMS equation are determined by the single real number mu that was in the equation. That's the only input apart from the order of the equation. So here's a nice example, which will show you exactly what this story is about. I'm sorry if it's a little small to read at the back, but these are the two characters you get for a particular value of mu. And you see that the first line has all integer positive integers and the second has all positive except for a one seventh. So if I normalize by multiplying it by seven, this is a homogeneous equation, so I can do that. Then uh, both are admissible. And the nice thing is that without much effort, you can guess what the CFT is. It's a CFT with four, central charge 14 uh, by five and is the central charge of G2 at level one. On the other hand, with a slightly different mu, uh, this is what the series comes out to be. This time the Q power uh, for the first line is minus 13 by 120, there it's minus 14 by 120. So a little jiggle in that value of mu. And as you can see, it just goes to hell. It just has coefficients which have bigger and bigger denominators as you go along the series. And this is something you can never normalize to be integral. And so this cannot be an admissible character. So this is the philosophy. Yeah, mu is the parameter in the original equation, the single parameter, it's left arbitrary. And now what we do is we ask, can the is the first coefficient uh, beyond the leading one an integer? So that fixes mu to be a set of possible values. Then we look for the second coefficient. So mu is narrowed down to a smaller set of values and we keep going on. It's very experimental. And this is the table we came up with. And it has a bunch of interesting features uh, but as you can see, uh, we not only found, uh, first of all, we found a finite and interesting set of admissible characters. Uh, so these are all the admissible characters for P equals two, two primaries, uh, sorry, uh, N equals two, two characters and L equals zero. And we were able to guess right away, just looking at the central charge, the conformal dimension, and the first column gives you the dimension of the first level descendants over the identity, which tells you the Katz-Moody algebra, if it's a Katz-Moody theory. And so it was pretty easy to guess, except for the weird first and second last cases. Um, and it brings together a bunch of quite disparate Katz-Moody characters, which earlier were discussed in separate series by Knizhnik and Zamolodchikov. Also, there's this weird second last entry, which apparently has a Katz-Moody algebra of dimension 190, which uh, is not no, was not known to us, wasn't actually known at, to anyone at the time, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, so there's an interesting story about that, but it's not relevant to my talk. So uh, unfortunately, T is greater than 25 minutes. I'm at 30 minutes. I'm really at 25. You said it, Jeff. Thank you. Very kind of you. Okay. So uh, unknown to us, Svitanovich had the same list of Lie algebras in his famous book on bird tracks. And Dilin, eight years after us, wrote this paper, uh, which has, as you can see, the same list, A1, A2, G2, D4, F4, E6, E7, E8. He called them all exceptional. What you know, normal, what, what, what those of us who know a little Lie algebra would call exceptional are only G2, F4, E6, E7, E8, but he found the others fit naturally and maybe that was known, but he also found some miraculous formulae for dimensions of representations and other things. But I emphasize that what's on this page is about Lie algebras and not about Katz-Moody algebras or about conformal field theory. And I think it's still unexplained why two character CFTs with L equals zero specifically are in correspondence with this Svitanovich Dillian series. Okay, few more comments about what we found. So in every case we tried to use, so once we know the characters, we know their modular transformations. Once we know that we can plug them into this formula and uh, uh, experience that excitement that numbers like one over root two or whatever the S's might be. Uh, miraculously, when you uh, perform the sum, give me fusion rule coefficients, which are non-negative in integers. 
Uh, however, in one case, the first case with central charge two fifth, we found a fusion rule that was actually negative. And then we realized that that's because we misidentified what's the identity and non-identity character. You can exchange them at the cost of sending the central charge to C minus 24H and H to minus H. Once you do that, the central charge is minus 22 by five. The fusion rules get fixed to be positive again. Uh, and this uh, is a very well-known CFT, a non-unitary CFT with negative C, and it describes the Li Yang edge singularity CFT. So we did find it as a solution of our second order differential equation, but only after performing the switch. Now this one with 190 was bothering us. It had sim a similar feature. In fact, it had similar negative fusion rules. Uh, so we tried to exchange the characters, but now we found in that case, that the identity is 57 fold degenerate. And we didn't realize as uh, you know, we didn't know anything about moonshine that 57 is 56 plus one. This is very important. Okay. So now fifth, uh, degenerate identity is unacceptable in a QFT. So we threw away this theory and said, well, this is an admissible character, but not really admissible because it has a degenerate vacuum state. Uh, it's also non-unitary, but we were we were happy with that. But uh, but uh, but for the degenerate vacuum. Now, after Dillian's work, a famous uh, I think reasonably of a famous work by Landsberg and Manuel noted that Dillian's uh, identities and formulae had a missing uh, had a hole in them between E7 and E8, and they proposed to fill this hole with an intermediate Lie algebra of dimension 190. And so they called it seven and a half and they associated it to sextonians, whatever those might be. And so, yeah, of course, both things don't exist, but apparently in the same way. And this is an important, interesting thing if you generalize your assumptions. So uh, suddenly E seven and a half became promoted to an intermediate vertex operator algebra, uh, sorry, intermediate Lie algebra. And then uh, Kawasetsu, uh, a Japanese mathematician proposed that there could be rational CFTs with intermediate vertex operator algebras. And it's okay if they have negative fusion rules. So they're not RCFTs, but they're something else. And they're called IVOA. And this is his paper. And in this paper, uh, his first two examples, which he uh, nicely attributed to us, are in fact the 2 fifth and 38 by 5 IVOAs, and now they are called A0 because that comes before A1, and E7.5 because it comes between E7 and E8. I assume these are at level 1, but of course I don't know what they are, so I can't tell you if they're at level 1 or not. <laughs> Everything else is at level 1. Okay. Good, so that's the digression. It's not very closely related to this talk, these last few things, but it was kind of fun. Uh, I found out about most of these developments from Tachikawa only about five years ago. Uh, I just didn't know this literature. Okay, now we are interested in a much narrower canvas, unitary CFT with consistent fusion rules and exactly two primaries. And so we have to discard a lot of the MMS examples. The IVOAs are out, inconsistent fusion rules, or by switching, they become non-unitary. There was E81, which I didn't mention. It's uh, it's masquerading as a two CFT, but it's really a one CFT. So the other character is spurious. Uh, there are also some of our examples had A2, D4, and E6. And in each of these cases, there are multiple primaries with the same character. Uh, for example, the three and three bar of A2. So we discard these also for today's purposes. One could add them back to generalize the work I'm going to propose, but somehow the thing worked smoothly after that. So once we did all that, we were left with this very pretty set of uh, four theories, A1 at level one, G21, F41, and E61, and this set of central charges. Okay. And recently this set, as long, along I think with most of our other examples, was shown to be unique. Okay. Now let's consider the next value of L. Now you're probably thinking at this rate, if I do one value of L every half an hour, it will take uh, till at least uh, next year for me to finish, but that, that, that's not, well, the subject, the subject moved in a different way. So two comma two, I'm not going to go through the details. It's the same idea with E6 by E4 inside the MLDE. Uh, absolutely straightforward. And in fact, Nisulich did this, but he ended saying he's not sure if these are theories. He stopped by finding admissible characters. Uh, it's interesting that if you subtract 
the central charges of my previous list from 24, you get these central charges, which should have been a very, very loud hint, but we didn't take it. Nobody took it for three decades uh, until finally, uh, in co uh, collaboration with Matthias Gabardiel, we figured out what these are. And we used a variant of the Cosette construction of Goddard, Kent, and Olive. So people in CFT know that the usual cosets are of the form divide of Vesumino written model by another, but we use the kind where the numerator is instead a one CFT or a meromorphic CFT. And this idea is mentioned in these physics papers and it's developed in many math papers. I've probably not cited all, but this is one of the standard references which talks of conjugate modular tensor categories, which can be glued together. So it's somehow associated to that. The nice thing about these examples is the denominator theory and the theory on the coset theory on the left side have the same number of characters uh, because A is a one character theory, otherwise it's more complicated. Okay, now a little digression about one CFTs. Uh, they exist only at central charge a multiple of eight. And there's a relation uh, between the Ronskian index of the Cosette theory L tilde in terms of M, which defines that central charge, the L of the denominator, Ronskian index of the denominator, and also an integer N, which is the sum of the integers of the Cosette pair. The Cosette pair conformal dimensions must add up to integers because the final theory has only integer dimensions. A one CFT only has integral dimensions. The partition function of a one CFT is like that. Um, this implies that the single character is a function of the Klein invariant, has to be a special kind of function. Powers of one third and two third are allowed, otherwise it's polynomial, um, uh, at times polynomials in general. And so these are some very well known um, uh, one CFTs with these central charges. Uh, and all these examples are the easy ones to find, quote unquote, because of course, Goddard and Olive did a, a masterful job and probably many other people uh, in finding them. But basically now we understand that it's the story of even unimodular lattices, uh, but there are more general possibilities which are non-lattice theories and that's where all the difficulty really lies. Now C equals 24 is very interesting because chi is J because it goes like Q to the minus one. That just means C is 24, but you can add any integer as Don also mentioned yesterday, and it's still uh, modular invariant. So it's admissible for all N greater than that number, but out of these infinitely many possibilities, there are just 71 CFTs and an even smaller number of Ns. I think there are about 42 different Ns with 71 CFTs. They include, the, they include the lattice theories and a finite number of generalizations involving orbifold and so on. And in most cases, they correspond to special modular invariant combinations of characters for non-simple Katsumudi algebras. And I'll show you some examples to make this point clearer. In fact, here's the example. Uh, take D7 at level three, A3 at level one, G2 at level one, and take the tensor product of these CFTs. If you do this naively, you'll get about 200 primaries. So not interesting or not particularly easy to deal with, but there's an extension where you can take linear combinations of the characters. In fact, one linear combination of the characters of this messy theory, uh, which itself is modular invariant. And then that defines the CFT, Shelikens number 34. Shelikens has table numbered one to 71, and this is theory 34. Now we can take the quotient of this by G21, which is a two character theory. And to do it, we just cancel G21 in that top line and we are left with D73831. But again, not the theory with a hundred primaries, an extension of it, which has only two primaries and central charge 106 by five. So this is sort of the mechanism that Gabardil, Hampapura and I discussed. And uh, I'll call these trivial quotients or deleting quotients because you just strike off one of the factors and you've got the quotient. It doesn't always work like that. Those are the harder cases. So there are 13 such trivial quotients and we got 13 theories with L equals two, two primaries and uh, central charges happen to lie in this range. And this explains in particular what Nisulich found in 89. Okay, finally, for this discussion, if you tensor E8, which has a single character with any uh, theory of any L, you, uh, two, two primary theory, you get uh, L jumping by four. 
that's an easy thing to show. Uh, in certain sense, EA, E8 alone has L equals two. So if you tens, if you square it, you get L equals four. And so here are four product CFTs with L equals four. And there are two more interesting ones, which are obtained by taking D16, the extension of it, the heterotic string one, and dividing by either A11 or G21. You can't divide by F41 or E61 because they don't embed. And these, um, uh, these quotients give us two more theories. And these quotients are the hard ones because you have to figure out how A11 sits in D161. And that's a lot harder than saying that the denominator just cancels something in the numerator that anyone can say. Here you have to work out the rules for these kind of conformal embeddings. Okay. Now, here's an already an interesting case that's posed by these last two examples. If you compute the central charge, first you have to compute the commutant of the denominator in the numerator. That's pretty easy. So the commutant of A11 is A11D141, and the commutant of uh, G21 is B121. This you can find out. I think uh, most of these were done actually by Brandon using GAP software. Now there's a puzzle because A11D141 has central charge 15, as you can right away see, and that's 16 from the numerator minus one from the denominator. But the central charge of B121 is 25 by two, and that's not equal to 16 minus 14 by five, the numerator minus the denominator. It leaves a deficit of seven by 10. Now, anybody who's worked in conformal field theory loves this number seven by 10. So seven by 10 is the central charge of the tricritical icing model. So we conclude that by taking the quotient of D16 by G21, you get a theory which has a B12-1 Katz-Moody algebra and a tricritical icing model module, model module uh, combined in a way that gives me a two character theory. And this is quite fascinating. So there's an important lesson here. There are two character extensions of direct sums of both Katz Moody and Vera Soro modules. This did not happen to Shelikins. In his, it could have happened, I mean, in some hypothetical world, but at C equals 24, that just doesn't happen. Uh, while uh, in these quotients, it does happen. So that's very interesting. This also says, and this is a very nice comment Brandon made to me, that this means that we couldn't have done our classification by repeating Shelikins' methods because they crucially relied on the fact that except for the monster, everybody else is a direct sum of non-abelian algebras. He even didn't find abelian facts. So except for the monster and the leech lattice, all the other 69 are non-abelian. Here we have hybrids. Okay, so we found six uh, new CFTs with L equals four, uh, and that's quite a bunch. And now we can get finally to the real classification problem, which I think I have enough time for. So. Uh, are there any questions up to this point? I really should have paused earlier. Okay, now uh, I didn't claim yet, and I didn't know actually, whether the cosets we found exhaust all two CFT with L equals zero, two, and four. I should have written here L equals zero, two, and four. Uh, in fact, just for the case of two primaries, we can be sure that they do. And there's a rule called the gluing principle, which guarantees that. So here's some notation. Supposing we have a pair of CFT with characters chi i and chi i tilde, and they transform in modular representations rho and rho tilde. Now suppose rho tilde is rho star, which is the conjugate representation to rho. Then this bilinear combination of the characters with suitable normalizations has to be modular invariant. That's what the conjugacy of the two representations means. So it pairs to a modular invariant. However, this is a little too strong. Uh, you can also, if you define omega by that cube root of uh, unity, then you can also allow rho tilde to be omega to the n a phase times rho star. In that case, uh, when you pair them up, rho cancels rho star, and you're left with modular invariance up to a phase omega to the n, where n can be 0, 1, and 2. And that's exactly the modular behavior of a one CFT with central charge 8n. So it follows that, in fact, the general pairing relation is that if chi and chi tilde are chosen appropriately, they will pair up into a one CFT. So it's sort of an assured thing. Now, the extra information here is that all the objects here describe actual CFT and unique CFT, not just characters. 
And I'll just explain why. Okay. And this bilinear relation is equivalent to the coset relation. It's like taking the denominator of the coset to the other side. It's basically another way to state the coset relation. And so this is the necessary condition for the coset relation to hold. But now here is me on the mathematical bridge about to fall in. Uh, I've never used these words in a talk before, but the modular tensor category uh, for pri two primaries is uniquely specified by its modular representation. That's not in general the case. So only in, uh, it might be the case for three under some conditions for three primaries, but here we only have two. So the statement is that when these things pair up uh, with conjugate modular representations, they really are dual and lead to a new, uh, to, a, to a meromorphic or one CFT. So this condition on top is sufficient to imply the coset relation, not just necessary. And from this, it follows that all two CFT with a given modular representation can be found as cosets of some one CFT by a two CFT having the conjugate representation. And this is the key which allowed us to finish the classification. First of all, this already says that the cases with L equals two and four that we discussed are complete, okay? Because it's easy to verify that there are no other cosets within C less than 25, uh, which have uh, these values of L two and four. Okay, now for the last thing, I need just a little bit more to introduce just one more concept. And I'm sorry, this is all uh, maybe very heavy stuff, but let me just say it as briefly as I can. So uh, the problem is that once you're at L equals six or beyond, you cannot use the MLDE effectively directly anymore because it starts to have too many parameters. Roughly speaking, the, in the same sense that the number of modular forms jumps at weight 12 because delta shows up, uh, the number of parameters jumps at L equals six for exactly the same reason, actually. And now you no longer can scan effectively. I don't rule it out, but nobody has done it. We haven't done it. Uh, but we first learned from work of Jeff with his student Wu that there are admissible characters for two CFT with L greater than or equal to six. And they used a method called Heke images. But uh, we used a different method, quasi characters, and which I'll just explain. And we found a complete classification of all admissible characters with uh, two character for two character theories and with any L greater than or equal to six. And this came in very handy. And here is where the work of Kaneko Zagie and Kaneko Koike and so on came in. So what we didn't know for 30, 30 years or so is that the same MMS equation or Kaneko Zagie equation has more solutions than we had found, uh, except that they are not always positive. They're integral, but not positive. So if you just relax positivity, the same equation, which had only a few integral solutions, I mean, all the coefficient positive integers, now has integral non-positive solutions. And there are infinitely many of them, and it's a wonderful set. And our key result, is that all admissible characters with any L equals of the form 6N, 6N plus two or 6N plus four arise as linear combinations of suitable quasi characters with L equals zero, two and four. Now those are the MLDs that we know, that we know how to deal with. So this expresses a more difficult problem in terms of a simpler family of MLDs, which already exist. And of these, the L equals zero equation is the one that was analyzed by Kaneko and Koike, and we generalized it to the other cases. So before this gets too abstract, let me show you an example. So the A1 series of quasi characters with L equals zero has all these central charges for all integer N. And for N equals zero and one, you see that the central charges are one and seven, and we get our favorite A1 and E7 theories. But for all other N, so here's a, an example of the A1 theory identity character, nice and positive. But if you make N equals four and C equals 25, then you get one and exactly one negative coefficient minus 245. All the others are positive. So these are quasi characters. Now, I didn't know this till last week, but apparently this could also be related to something called virtual representations, which I heard about in Jeff's talk. Certainly this is not a CFT by itself, but it's a building block for a CFT. And let me explain that. Okay, I think I need not go through the full set of quasi characters. Uh, I'll just talk about 
how you in one case you can get a linear combination. So the idea here is the following that under shifts of central charge by 24, quasi characters um, have the same modular representation. It's periodic under C goes to C plus 24. So nothing stops me from adding the n equals zero quasi characters and the n equals four characters. Whatever I end up with are still integral characters. Okay. And out of these, n equals four is positive. That's the A1. And n equals four is the quasi character with minus 245 in it. But if I add them with an arbitrary coefficient, then you see I get n minus 245 sitting in that first place. And so I just have to take n to be greater than or equal to 245, and I have an admissible character. So this is the idea of adding quasi-characters. Now, the important point is that the n equals 0 and n equals 4 quasi-characters are solutions of the same equation with two different parameters. So if I add them, they're not solutions of that equation anymore. Okay. Though it was the same equation, there are two different values of the parameters in the equation. And in fact, you can read off the value of L associated to this sum uh, by just reading off C and H and then using Riemann rock backwards. And you find that this sum has L equals 6. So by adding two L equals 0 quasi characters, we got L equals 6. If you add 3, you'll get L equals 12. If you add n plus 1 of them, you'll get L equals 6n. Now, it's still complicated, you know, how to add them to make sure everything's positive, but there's some sort of positive domain of integers with which you can add them and make them positive. Uh, we can similarly find quasi-characters with Ronskian index 2 and 4, and taking linear combinations, we get the 6n plus 2 and 6n plus 4 series. And in this, so now the key thing is, we were able to prove that all admissible characters two character sets are generated by this process. This is something I, I, I feel is quite an extraordinary result. And now this immediately leads us to our complete classification. Okay. So now we turn to the general problem. And I recall for you this Riemann-Roch relation. And by putting C less than 25, we've and saying it's unitary, L also obeys a bound. Uh, and the bound is that L is less than or equal to 12. Okay, so that's at least finite. So I've done 0, 2, and 4. So I have in seven minutes, I have to do 6, 8, 10, and 12. Fortunately, there isn't anything at 6, 10, and 12 because there are no admissible characters with those values of L in this range of central charge. So this is how quasi-characters help you. They rule out lots of things and they also help you to find the partition function of the things that are not ruled out. So that only leaves 0, 2, 4, and 8. And we've already done 0, 0, 2, and 4. So that only really leaves 8. Now with 8, we have to look at, uh, so I'll remind you, with 0, 2, and 4, we had 23 theories. So I have 100 more to find. And for this, we had to look at all possible modular representations for 2CFT. And this was done by Mason very explicitly in 2008, where he found 54 possible two-dimensional representations of SL2Z. Uh, the problem with many of them is that they didn't satisfy basic CFT requirements, uh, such as that the modular transformation S matrix should square to one rather than minus one. Actually, half of them have f s squared equals minus one, so they're gone. Uh, the other half, about 50, I think 15 of them are gone because they give you inconsistent fusion rules, yes? Yeah, but here there is no charge conjugate, there's no non-trivial charge conjugation because we have only two primaries, so the primary is real. If you had three primaries, then yes. No, you do, but we're not counting them. That's why we have, our classification is for two primaries and not two. Yeah, 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 exactly. So exactly why we restrict to two simple modules, because with three, this is a, this could be an issue. Okay. So also from, so we narrow everything down to 12 representations, and then we are able to tell you what should be the L value mod six of those 12. The first four are L equals zero mod six. And of course, there is no L equals six and 12, I already told you, so that's L equals zero, it's done. L equals two mod six is interesting because that's the cosets we found plus something more which we haven't found. 
which would have L equals eight, which corresponds to that second line. L equals four mod six again means L equals four because there's no 10. So, and those are these examples that we've already found. So we've confirmed that we found a lot of things. And here is where we use C less than 25 very crucially. So let me explain why. Uh, everything that has to be a coset has to be a coset of some one CFT, but the one CFT could have central charge, you know, eight times a million. The point is it's a coset by only one of the top four line, which have central charge one, seven, 14 by five and 26 by five. So the lowest central charge I can get is by quotienting with E7. Now, if I did uh, allow C equals 25, I would need to consider quotients of C equals 32 meromorphic CFT by E7, which is 32 minus seven is 25. And here I'm sunk because classifying all one CFT at C equals 32 is many billion lattices plus many billion more unknown non-lattice theories and is just hopeless. So this is where C equals 25 comes in as a bound, strict bound. Okay, so this confirms that L equals zero to four is complete. Um, and the interesting part now remaining is that to get L equals eight, you have to carry out these non-trivial embeddings where the denominator goes as a proper subalgebra of some numerator algebra. And so this is the conclusion that every CFT with L equals eight is a coset of a C equals, okay, and C less than 25, which I didn't say, I should keep saying that, is a coset of one CFT at C equals 24 by one of these, but embedded properly inside a simple factor. And the resulting central charges are easy to read off. These are the only four central charges. So we find something like a hundred theories scattered with these four central charges. So this complicated exercise involves Dinkin indices and embedding indices. And as I said, we found a hundred theories. Just to show you an example, if we want to embed A11 in that direct sum, which is one of Schellekens' theories, we can fit A11 into A31, or we can fit it into G21. We can't fit it in D73 because uh, the level of D7 is three, which is too high. It has to be less than or equal to the denominator for there to be an embedding. And then you have to worry whether A11 embeds uniquely in A31 or in many different ways. And so all that is what we did. And uh, something has gone huh? Okay, so I'm done and I just will show you the tables, but let me just summarize some features. The Ronskian indices in this range, C less than 25 with two primaries are only zero, two, four, and eight. Some theories have complete katz moody algebras, which means if I sum over their central charge, that's uh, the total central charge of the theory. Some have incomplete ones with minimal models and the minimal models that appear in our examples are seven tenth, four fifth, I think you can recognize those and half plus seven tenth, all are very famous minimal models. Also some theories have both non-abelian and U, U1 factors. Uh, there are many theories with the same C, but different H and also with the same C and H. So there are two theories with this pair of C and H and 27 with that pair of C and H. And there were a couple of subtleties. You're probably exhausted by now and it's getting hotter or more humid. Or am I imagining it? It is? Okay. Uh, hmm? uh, yeah, well, um, okay. So here's a fun question. Supposing my Shelikin's theory has A11, many copies of it. Does it matter whether my denominator A11 is a, deletes one of these or another one? I would have thought no, but Brandon uh, thought maybe. And then we wrote to these authors who actually uh, very recently uh, classified the automorphisms of the Shelikin's theories. So the question became askable. Uh, and the answer is, if the automorphism of the Shelikin's theory happens to permute the M factors, then you're good, then any of them is the same. If it doesn't happen to permute those factors, then you get different theories depending which A11 you delete. And that happens in two cases. Uh, so D65 comes with A11 squared, but I put a prime just to uh, separate them. Then if I if my denominators, the A11 or A11 prime, these are two different theories with, yeah, 
with the same central charges, with the same, I mean, same uh, Katz-Moody algebra, there's almost nothing you, well, there's a different modular invariant. So the modular invariants are not equivalent, uh, but the answer is the same. Okay, good. And then there's this, uh, this, I'm sure you don't want to know, but we check linearly equivalent embeddings and apparently they're not e the same as equivalent embeddings. Linearly equivalent means they're equivalent in GLN in a in, of all finite dimensional representations. And apparently, uh, so this is Minchenko based, basing out of the original work of Dinkin who actually solved most of this problem. He completed it. Okay, so anyway, we check that this problem doesn't affect us and here's the answer. So here are the first 82 theories, and here are the next uh, whatever number, making it up to one, two, three. I don't expect you can read this, but I put one enlarged transparency just to highlight a couple of cute things, and then I can stop. So uh, here, for example, we have three different Katz-Moody algebras and a tricritical model. Here we have the icing and tricritical models. Um, here we have a non-abelian, an abelian, and a tricritical model. And the point is that you know you can take any of these and write down all the characters easily because right, you know the three characters of this, the six of that, and the whatever, 10 of that. And that's just a fact. Now, if you're clever, you find linear combinations among this set, which reduce to two characters that transform under a uh, SL2Z and make up a two primary theory. And uh, what happens is that we've extended the Katz-Moody algebra. So these are called extensions of these algebras by higher spin generators. So that's sort of the idea. These curious numbers in the last column are the degeneracy of the non-identity uh, non primary. Sometimes it's very simple, uh, like two, and sometimes it's uh, 15847. Can't help that. Okay, so conclusions. Now, uh, Future directions, uh, C equals 25 theories. I think we found the first ones explicitly by writing a few cosets of C equals 32, but you, anyone can write a few cosets and I'm sure we can write a few more, but there are at least 10 to the nine uh, lattice theories in 32 dimensions, so we'll never finish. Uh, this whole approach should be related to the generalized Hecke operators that Jeff and his student uh, produced to map uh, I should have said this actually, to map theories with lower Ronskian index to higher Ronskian index. They do the same job as we did in a different way. Um, Brandon tells me there's a relation to penumbral moonshine, but this is another mathematical bridge that right now I'm only learning. Uh, more than two primaries still with C less than 25 might be tractable because we know quite a bit about three characters, but it's not clear how complete we can make it. And finally, there's this relation of these uh, kinds of CFTs to super conformal field theories in four dimensions, typically worked by uh, Leonardo Rastelli, Chris Beam, and so on. And uh, maybe all this is related uh, to that. Thank you. We're slightly over time, but maybe one question. Anybody has a question? So, well, hmm. so this, this, because of this embedding, you have sort of full control of these conformal field theories. If somebody said number 117, I want to know the yes. fusion matrices and everything, yes. then you could, in principle, compute anything you want. Actually, the fusion matrices are particularly simple because we knew the characters already. This promotes those characters to CFTs. If you know the characters, uh, and in the case of two primaries, they're hypergeometric functions. You know the monodromy matrix that tells you S from Verlinde, you get the fusion rules. And they're not, they're not too many fusion rules. So everything I've discussed is either phi cross phi equals one or phi cross phi equals one plus phi. That's uh, Semyon and Fibonacci fusion rules. So they're not, it's actually that data is trivial. Correlation functions might be more interesting. And I think in principle, it can be done. Okay, uh, let's thank Sunil again. Okay, so I'm hoping that we have Ken Ono uh, via Zoom.